Welcome to Train Signal. You are watching Physically Connecting vSphere Hosts. In this lesson, we're going to talk about you know, the many options and ways you can connect a vSphere host to your physical network. And we're going to start by talking about you know, what's the big deal. I get a lot of questions on this. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Constantly ask what's the right way, what's the wrong way. So we'll start talking about that. You know, move into physical connectivity thoughts and best practices. Just some things that I see, common areas of confusion and some best practice recommendations. Give you some topology examples, some suggested topologies, then we'll go through the physical switch configuration for how you configure those ports that connect to the vSphere host, and finally network teaming and load balancing which is one of those areas that usually causes some confusion and misconfiguration, so we'll spend some time there. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So first, what's the big deal? One of the most common questions I get when doing vSphere designs is how to connect the host to the network. There's a lot of different options, a lot of ways, and to be honest, you know, there's not always a completely right and wrong answer. It really depends on the design, and you need to understand what your requirements are as far as resiliency, bandwidth, throughput, capability, load balancing, and all that, and look at that and your constraints against maybe what kind of switches you have, you know, what kind of clustering you can do, what kind of load balancing you can do, you know, all these things come into play. And there's a lot of these things, you know, that kind of dictate the design. Are you using 1 gig ports? Do you have 10 gig ports? Are you using IP storage or fiber channel storage? Hardware switches, you know, what kind, who made them, can they stack, can they talk? And, you know, what's my VM traffic requirements, which often people don't know until they virtualize a lot of hosts. So again, you know, a lot of these things have to be taken into account. My main focus when I do these designs is to make the configuration scalable. If we miss on the VM requirements, I want to make it easy to be able to, you know, supplement that with additional throughput. If we miss on something else, I want it to be easily to scale or easy to change. Every environment is different. So again, you know, I said a minute ago, there's really no perfect answer. So I don't have this big list of reference uh, connectivity architectures and say, go pick that one. Because, you know, it completely varies. The way I do some network design is different than even, you know, how others do network design. Uh, everybody has their own way. We kind of have standards at Vero on how we do things. But really, there's still a lot of art within this science. And installations often differ due to different requirements. I mean, not everybody uses all features. Not everybody uses fault tolerance. Uh, some people, you know, use fiber channel and have no use for NAS, so we don't have to dedicate connectivity for NAS. And it just, you know, it varies. It's very common to see people overestimate requirements. You know, I see this a lot. I see people who throw a lot of NICs in servers, you know, they'll put six 1 gig connections for VM traffic and never use more than two. Or they want to do four NICs for iSCSI traffic because they think they need four gigabit like they'd get with Fiber Channel and they never go above one. Things like that. And, you know, I'm not one to talk someone out of overbuilding, you know, an environment. I'm, I'm all about overkill. But understand that with that comes a cost. It does give you headroom. It does give you capability, but it does come at cost. It can add complexity, additional cabling, you know, everything that goes along with it. So before you just kind of shotgun something, keep those things in mind. I've got a couple of good links here. Two people I know real well, Kendrick Coleman and Scott Lowe, both have some good blog posts. Kendrick has, uh, he's got several kind of reference host network design layouts, so it's got that on his blog. That's really interesting to read those. Scott Lowe has done this vSphere network design presentation and a few vMugs. I really wish that he had the capability to host a video of him doing that presentation, but the slide deck is up there and it kind of covers a lot of different things as far as how to kind of, you know, what traffic you might want to mix, what you don't want to mix, things like that. So, you know, take a look at those and take that as input for your design as well. So some, you know, connectivity best practices. First of all, if possible, use redundant NICs on different cards. So, uh, you know, I've mentioned this uh, before, but it's often we see servers now with two or four onboard NICs. We usually put in, you know, maybe two dual ports or a quad port or two quad port NIC cards inside the servers that run vSphere. But when you're doing redundant connectivity, let's say management, and we want to put two, you know, two VM NICs into the vSwitch, we want to make sure we pull one off the onboard and one off of the PCIe card. Reason for that is I don't want that card to die and take both management ports with it 
or you know if you look on board it's the same chipset design as you'll see on a card so you don't want something there on the board going bad and taking all your ports with it so if possible kind of stripe things across different cards or cards and in internal if traffic types will be mixed look at the profile of that traffic is it bursty is it sustained is it a lot of traffic like say you know NAS or vMotion would be or is it low traffic like say management would be and it's common to share NICs with things like vMotion and management you know things that are kind of high traffic or bursty with low traffic management because we really don't you know don't see a problem so again it's common I see people kind of overbuild and they'll dedicate two NICs to management and two NICs to vMotion and two NICs to iSCSI and two NICs to this and four NICs to VMs and again you can do that but you know additional complexity additional cost Going back to the previous slide, Scott Lowe has some good kind of tables on what you, you know, recommendations for sharing. Highly suggest you never share NICs with IP storage. We want storage to be low latency. Most people think about storage and throughput. You know, I, I very often talk to people about virtualizing, you know, SQL databases, Exchange, SharePoint, things like that. And they look at me funny when I talk about, well, you can absolutely do this with, you know, Gigabit iSCSI or NFS. And you know the idea is that storage is usually about how many IOPS I can push across and what is my latency so when I make a request how fast can I get the request or the answer back it's usually not a question around throughput so exchange something or SQL is a good example they they do small transactions usually like 4k 8k transactions to storage and back and it, it's usually a lot of IOPS but not a lot of throughput but we don't want to share that even though you know because we don't want to have vMotion or even management or something like that cause latency to go up because the NIC is busy sending some other frames you know he can't send the, the uh, storage requests and therefore latency goes up so don't share NICs that are doing IP storage unless and I'll put a caveat on this if you're doing 10 gig Ethernet then we can do some sharing and we'll see that later but if you're doing one gig, don't share. Ten gig, yeah, that's more of a much more of an option. Fault tolerance really wants dedicated NICs, but they don't have to be redundant. So if you want to use fault tolerance and you don't want to continue to add, you know, ports to each of your hosts, you can do a single NIC for fault tolerance. And if that NIC should fail, port should fail, you know, it will restart the FTVM on another host to be protected. So it's not required to be redundant. I haven't seen a big adoption rate for fault tolerance, mainly because of that single vCPU limitation. Hopefully we'll see that going away. Uh, as soon as it does, I think fault tolerance, you know, deployments will go way up and we're going to see more people use this. But again, it really wants a dedicated NIC. It throws a lot of stuff across those connections and it's latency sensitive. Remember, it's keeping another VM in lockstep on another host. You don't want to drive latency up. So keep that as low latency as you can. Management, again, is very low. It can be shared often on vMotion NICs with a different VLAN. So we'll have, you know, two NICs for vMotion slash management. vMotion might be on VLAN 20. Management might be on VLAN 2. They're really not going to have an issue there. So, you know, that's pretty common things for that. I, I get asked all the time, do I have to dedicate NICs for management? No, you really don't. Some topology suggestions. You know, the final configuration depends on how many NICs you have per server and kind of how you want to slice and dice those up. It's pretty common to see 6 or 8 gigabit NICs. I've seen up to 12 in a server. I thought that was overkill at the time. The, you know, customer I was working with agreed, but you know what? We've got a lot of switch ports. We've got a lot of NICs. We might as well use them. And really, I'm not going to argue with that. If I had 12 and I had the switch ports, I'd probably use them too. But it really just depends. So utilizing, you know, things like fault tolerance and or IP storage adds additional requirements, you know, seeing as both really want dedicated NICs. It's common to see, you know, fiber channel, and then we, you know, can cut back some NICs. Or if you're just using, say, NFS for ISO storage, then, you know, we can talk about whether you need dedicated NICs for that, because that's fairly common, too. I'll see people do fiber channel for data store VMs and production VMs. But their ISOs for building new VMs are sitting on an NFS data store. And I'm not going to you know, say you need to dedicate two NICs just for the occasional time you build a new template image off an ISO. But if you're doing production workloads, you won't dedicate it. So it's recommended to have six NICs for fiber channel, eight NICs for IP storage. That's kind of a standard deployment model for us. Again, 
if you had a ton of high throughput VMs that are just going to crush it on traffic, then we're going to raise that number. But, you know, it, again, it just depends on your requirements. And the bigger hammer is 10 gig Ethernet. So, you know, I used to work for a large investment bank and our VMware uh, is servers and our racks that held those servers, you know, you can't see my hands, but it had a, like a huge cable bundle going to the bottom of the rack. And we would distribute distribute it out. I mean, you think you have, you know, eight or I believe we had, you know, 10 cables going to every server. We've got, you know, all the VMs, you know, this traffic just for vSphere, for IP storage, management, you know, you think about the lights out management, and those sorts of connections as well. It really starts to add up and cabling becomes an issue, it becomes a, an issue just on physical space in a rack. It becomes an issue on switch ports and, you know, it becomes an issue on weight. You know, people don't think about the amount of weight in a bundle of cables, but you do rack after rack, overhead cabling or under floor. I mean, you add that together. And if you're building a data center that's not on the ground floor, then that really becomes an issue because you have a certain number of pounds per square foot that you have to average. So people are looking at ways to reduce this. And, you know, with 10 gig, we can reduce cables down, NICs, switches, everything down, which reduces my, you know, deployment costs my power, which also reduces cooling, and, you know, I can give you two 10 gig NICs and give you a lot better throughput than, say, even 20 1 gig connections because of the way that load balancing works. So it is kind of this, what I say, is the bigger hammer. And there's some things you need to be concerned about as far as the design. I see a lot of people just throw two 10 gig ports in a server, connect it up, and think all is good. And a lot of times it is, but some things change. For one, with vSphere 4.1 and newer, vMotion can use up to 8 gigabit. If it sees a 10 gig NIC, it'll fire off 8 vMotions at a time and use 8 gigabit. Well, what if I'm doing iSCSI or NFS over that as well? And VM traffic. You know, you have the chance of I.O. starvation, so we want to use some things like network I.O. control or other methods for traffic shaping. And we can do that. We'll talk about network I.O. control in a later lesson. You can also do things within switches or, you know, blade enclosures, Cisco UCS, for example. What we'll do there is we actually do ingress and egress traffic shaping and rate limiting for vMotion so it doesn't cause I.O. starvation there. But again, you can do it in vSphere itself. Just understand that 10 gig isn't a magic bullet. It's a magic bullet for a lot of things and a lot of people, but not for everybody, especially if we start doing maintenance mode on really dense vSphere hosts, things like that. We just want to watch what happens in those instances. So here's a quick example configuration with eight ports. We're going to do more examples, especially in the distributed switching lesson. But I just wanted to kind of give you a quick, you know, once over. So this is a normal eight port configuration. And if we look, it's pretty simple. This is a standard V switches. If you want to pretend this is a DV switch, then just pretend these are port groups and, and all this is one switch. And we've got, you know, the, these NICs in each port group set is active and all the rest set is, uh, say, unused. And that's kind of the discussion we're going to have in the VDS lesson later. So here we can see we've got two upstream switches. We've got each thing has, you know, two or four NICs. So for vMotion management, I mentioned we could share that. We use vMotion VLAN and management VLAN. They're running balanced over the same two NICs. NIC 0 onboard goes to switch 1. NIC 4 which is a uh, PCIe adapter, goes to the other switch. So if we fail this adapter, we're still running and good. Same thing here for NFS. If you use iSCSI, we can just switch this to iSCSI. But again, onboard to one switch, adapter to the other. And then we've got VM traffic. So with VM traffic, we can do multiple VLANs, however many you need. And then we alternate onboard and adapters to one switch or the other. And, and uh, if we want to use fault tolerance, we want to, you know, then we either reduce the VM NICs. We could share it with vMotion given the number of NICs we have. That is one option. Uh, it just again depends on what you're doing. If you're doing, say, four fault tolerance sessions on a host, you don't want to share that with vMotion. But if you're doing one, I mean, that is an option to do that. And it just shows you kind of how we split things out to multiple uplink switches. We could have four switches, two, four, three, whatever. And we just want to balance these across. So if we lose a switch, we lose the ports, we lose a card, we lose the on board, whatever. We want to maintain resiliency. Yeah, we're going to hurt for performance, but we're not going to take, take a full outage. And that's kind of the point here is to be able to be resilient and capable and not take a full on outage should we fail something. So again, 
Uh, Kendrick's got some good suggestions like 6 port, 8 port, things like that. And we're going to talk more about these in the distributed switching lesson. So you also need to worry about your physical switch configuration. And this isn't, you know, this isn't too complicated. Here's just some best practice recommendations. So your physical switch configuration must match the V-switch configuration, kind of, you know, obviously there. You need to be trunking the same VLANs. You need to be using the same load balance mechanism on both sides. If you don't, things aren't going to work. And that gets really weird, you know, because if I'm doing IP hashing on the vSphere host, but I'm doing MAC address hashing on the switch, you may actually hash, you know, in some instances where things work and then other things don't. You know, in the lab I see this where people will do this or in production. And it's funny because like, you know, a desktop machine or a client can get to some VMs and not others. And then the guy sitting next to him can get to the other VMs and not these. And, and so you, you can tell it's kind of a hashing problem. So you want to make sure those are aligned and we'll talk about those a little later. You need to also tell the switch that the vSphere system is an end host or it's connected to an edge port and not another switch. So the reason for this is simple. Switches are very guarded. They want to make sure that loops do not appear in the network because a loop in a switch network is normally very bad. Things will just kind of go around the network depending on how the loops are. You could have one packet that or one frame that gets turned into two, which turns into four, eight, sixteen, on and on and on until it completely collapses the network. So what they do in most common situations or default port settings on a switch is when I plug something into a switch, it goes through this spanning tree kind of learning listening process. And spanning tree is the protocol that we use to keep loops from forming. And it does this by listening on all ports and sending out these little frames called BPDUs. And you know the, it goes through an election process and there's a root bridge that sends these things out and on and on and on. But the point is, if I plug something into a switch, he's going to listen on that port, look and see, well, do I see, you know, if the root bridge sends out a BPDU, do I see it come back on that port? If I do, then I know that there's a loop somewhere, so I may need to block this port to keep a loop from forming. And this process can take 50 seconds before that, that switch port goes from like orange to green and data gets passed. So if you walk up and go, wait a minute, I need to unplug a port, oh, click, oh, wait, that's the wrong one, you plug it back in, that nick will be down for almost a minute. So what we can do is we can say, look, Mr. Switch, on these ports, I'm not going to connect you to a switch. You know, it's on me, I have the responsibility to know that that's not going to be a switch that gets plugged into there. So it's going to go ahead and transition to an active passing state much, much faster, usually very, usually instantly. But it's still going to listen. If he sees one of those special BPDU frames that gets sent from the root bridge come in on the port that you tell it is going to be an edge port, it will immediately shut that port down. It'll go, whoa, 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 whoa. We're going to shut this down because you told me there wasn't going to be a switch plugged in, and now there is. Obviously, something's going on here, and I'm going to protect the network. So two things. We need to tell it that it's an edge port or an in-host. We need to make darn sure we don't plug a switch into it. And you just want you know you just want to be careful about that configuration. So first we'll do a configuration example for the Cisco Nexus 5000, 5500, 7000, really anything in XOS. And I'll do this, and I'll do one for iOS since those are the most common that you'll see. So pretty simple configuration if you've ever used a Nexus device. Go into terminal mode, config terminal. Then we pick the interface that we're going to configure. Give it a description. I'm a big fan of putting like the vSphere host name and the VM NIC that we're going to plug in here. If you're going to put this in a port channel, which is required for some things like IP hashing, like we'll talk about later, you do that here. So you do channel group, and then pick you'll pick an unused port channel number. Or if this is another port in an existing channel, you'll use the same number. But you'll do channel group, port channel number, mode on. And you need to make sure and do mode on because you have to force channeling. VSphere doesn't support negotiation things like LACP, so you can't use mode active. Make sure it's mode on. Then, switch port mode trunk, so we're going to make sure this is a trunk port. Again, we talked about this with VLANs and tagging. We don't want to do access port. We want the switch to handle tagging of frames going across the link, so we'll do switch port mode trunk. Then, we need to tell spanning tree that this is an edge port, so instantly go to active mode, don't go through that learning listening process where we block the port for 50 seconds. So we do spanning tree port type edge trunk. And that'll tell it to go ahead and uh, listen. 
but if it does pick up, say, a BPDU frame or something like that, it will shut the port down. Then we want to tell it which VLANs we're going to trunk across this port. So we can do switch port trunk allowed VLAN all or give it a list. And I highly suggest you give it a list only the VLANs you actually want to trunk. So you could do things like 1 through 10 or 1 through 10, comma 15, comma 20, comma 30 dash 40. You can get very complex in ranging those VLANs. So I suggest you do that instead of VLAN all. Next is iOS configuration. So iOS is similar, a uh, little different, but similar. So again, we go into terminal mode. Then we pick the interface we're going to configure. So TE2 is like a 10 gig interface on some switches. Give it the description. And we want to tell the switch that this is a layer 2 switch port. So some switches you'll have to just say switch port. And that tells it it goes to layer 2 mode, not layer 3. Some of the older iOS switches support different trunk encapsulation protocols like ISL or some things like that, but we want to make sure that we use .1Q for all tagging. So we do switch port trunk encapsulation .1Q. Again, if it's a newer switch, it may look at you funny or come back with an error because that's the only thing it supports, but you just want to confirm that because that's the only thing vSphere supports is .1Q. Switch port mode trunk. Again, we're going to tell it this is a trunk port. We give it the list of allowed VLANs. We tell spanning tree this is an edge port by doing spanning tree port fast edge trunk. On some switches it may just be spanning tree port fast trunk. It depends on the iOS version and the switch. One of those should work. And then again we put it in a port channel if required for our hashing mechanism. Channel group, pick your channel number. Mode on, again we have to force the channel on. So with that let's go ahead and we're going to jump in the lab and I'll just run through these commands again. We're going to do one for iOS one for NXOS, and I'll show you an HP Pro Curve 1800, which is probably not a switch you're going to see in the Enterprise, a very common lab switch, very popular, fanless, 24 ports, gig, handles, uh, is managed with uh, VLANs and trunking capability, so it's common. The big thing here is I want to show you some of the HP terminology that they use, which is different than Cisco terminology. So you may be having a good conversation with someone managing HP Pro Curves when you're a Cisco guy and be talking about different things. So I want to show you that in the lab. So with that, let's go ahead and jump on over. Okay, let's see. First we'll load PuTTY. Then we will jump into, let's say, our Catalyst switch first. So this will be iOS. Log in with my super secret password. Go to enable mode. So first I'm going to pick an unused port, just as an example, interface, I think it's status. So this gives me a quick list of all those ports. I'm going to pick one that's not connected. To be honest, my switches in the lab are all Nexus, so I'm jumping on one of our access catalyst switches here to use there, and I'll do number seven. So we'll take a look at show running config interface G107. And that all looks good, so it's just a simple port. What we're going to do is just go ahead and configure it as we saw in the slide deck. So we do config terminal, interface G107, and we will do a description. You know, this would be, say, vSphere. In my lab, I'll say it's vSphere 3, uh, lab GSO, because this is our Greensboro lab, gso.local. And it's a VM NIC, say three. So that's often how I'll do this. I'll put the host and the VM NIC. Then I'll go tell it this is a switch port. And then we do our encapsulation. So switch port trunk, encap. And so this guy does .1Q and ISL, which is the older kind of standard that's not really a standard, and negotiate. So it'll try to negotiate which one it uses. Don't do that. vSphere doesn't like that. So we're going to use .1Q. Then we'll do spanning tree port fast. And we can do disable. We want to disable the port fast functionality. And if you notice, this one requires trunk. If we do edge like I had in the lab, it's going to say, or the uh, slide deck, it'll say no. So we just do trunk. And it's going to warn you, it should only be enabled on ports connected to a single host. Connecting hubs, concentrators, switches, bridges, whatever, to this interface when port fast is enabled may cause temporary bridging loops. Use with caution. So point here is plug this into a vSphere host and nothing else. And if we wanted to do a channel group, we would do channel group, and then you give it a number, 1 through 48. I'll say 40. I'm not going to enter this because I forgot to check which ones are in use. But we want to do mode, and then 
here's your options. Bottom line is this for vSphere using the standard V switch or the distributed switch you're going to do on. The 1000V does support LACP but we're not talking about that right now. So if you're going to use the standard distributed switch or V switch you want to set it for on which forces it not active which will enable LACP unconditionally so you would do on. Oops I jumped out of terminal mode there. Interface G107. So there's really nothing else to do here. So if we exit out again, show run and config, interface G107. And that's it. It's still set for access VLAN. So if you were set for access VLAN, you want to remove that. So you do no switch port access VLAN 7. Switch port mode trunk, port fast trunk, ncap.1q, and then we can also set the allowed VLAN list. So so we can do say by default it's going to allow all so if you type you know switch port allowed all it may just not even show it it just depends on what you're doing so trunk allowed VLAN and again you can the cool things are you can do all which is all none I'm not sure why you're going to do that but you can add you can remove so you don't have to retype the whole thing you can do stuff like 1 through 10 comma 11 comma 15 comma 25 through 30 you know stuff like that so you can get very specific and then you could do switch port allowed VLAN add 50 and it'll add it and so it's it's very flexible show running config again interface G107 and there you go and it did the ones that we added so that's it for Catalyst or iOS uh, very simple pretty straightforward so now let's jump over and do the Nexus which is going to be similar again So we'll jump on my Nexus 5010 here in Charlotte and we'll do the NXOS configuration. So log in as admin and the password. So on the Nexus we can do show interface brief, give a quick overview. I'll use say 13 or use 14 here as an example. This is the lab. I don't have any rack vSphere boxes. I've got Cisco UCS blade servers on connected to 9 through 12. An example of that configuration which is going to be very similar to what you're about to see since the UCS switch connections look like kind of like host or vSphere host to the network we see that it's you know trunk it's an edge port and I've got it in a channel group uh, they do support LACP so I've got it set for active but for this let's assume we're connecting say a rack mount vSphere host we'll do configure mode configure terminal interface E114 Pick the interface, do a description, say vSphere5.lab, CLT.local, VMNIC2. Then we'll do, you can do a channel group again. Channel group, I'll say, one thing I'll show you here on NXOS is it supports a lot of channel groups, so I'll do 3000, I know that's not used. Mode, and it only supports, Nexus only supports forced on, which is what we're going to use, because again, vSphere doesn't do LACP or it supports LACP in active and passive mode. Again, the Nexus 1000 vSwitch does support it, so we can do active, but since we're talking about the vSphere distributed switch or the standard switches, we'll have to do on. And next, we're going to do switch port mode trunk, and it's going to error. Yep. As soon as you put one of these ports into a channel group, it defaults to mode trunk, and it actually won't even let you use the mode command. If I do channel group 3000, take it out of the channel group, then I can do switch port mode and it gives me the command back so then I can do trunk. So just don't be surprised by that like I was the first time because I'm so used to typing that command that if you do put it in channel group it's gonna go ahead and default to trunk mode. So we're gonna do spanning tree port type edge trunk. It's gonna give you the same warning that we saw a minute ago with iOS and we can do switch port trunk allowed VLAN again. We can do all, add, remove, none, all that stuff. We saw that a minute ago, so I'm just going to say all. And that's pretty much it. So, I mean, Nexus config is very similar. There's a couple little different changes. We can do show. This is one of the things I like about NXOS. I don't have to do do commands to do things while I'm in configuration mode. So show running config of interface E114. Wait for it. There it is. Interface 114, it's got our description, it's got our trunk mode, 
spanning tree and since again I did allow VLAN all it doesn't show that since that's the default command but if I did it'd be like the iOS config where it listed it out but that's it for the lab so let's jump back over to the slide deck so now we are done with that piece of the lab that's my remote so we're gonna do the Procurve 1800 configuration now so we'll go ahead and we will jump to that So my iProCurve is, it's a web interface, so I think that's the password. Nope, was no password. Sneaky. We'll bring up the GUI, and just a couple of things that I want to show you. So this is the interface for the 1810. This has been a great lab switch. I also now use an SG300 from Cisco for Layer 3, but if you don't need simple, and I mean simple Layer 3, the Procurve is a great little lab switch. They're inexpensive. They're like 200 bucks, maybe a little more for the 24, you know, 220, something like that. And they do everything. They're fanless, low power, silent. But I want to show you the interface. So a couple of things here. First of all, we talk about trunk configurations. And when I normally talk about trunks, I talk about, you know, multiple VLANs being trunked across a connection. That's not really what they're talking about. What they mean is what we call lag group or a link aggregation group or what I just referred to on the iOS Nexus world as, say, a channel group, a port channel, an ether channel, those things. That's what HP means when they say trunk. So, you know, if you say, hey, have you trunked the connection to the vSphere host to an HP Procurve admin? They may not know what you mean exactly. So make sure you use similar terms. We do VLANs and they do what's called participation and tagging. So this configuration, it's, it's a little bit weird, but first of all, I've got all my VLANs, which I don't have a lot of because I don't use a switch anymore, but I've got default, VLAN 5 is my production network, 6 is vMotion, 7 is FT, and these down here, control and packet are for the Nexus 1000V, and external is my internet facing network. So I've got these, and you just basically come in here, check the box to create one, give it a number and then when it gets down here like use unused we'll use 14 and you say apply Oop, already exists oh that's right I have these they are just not named so let's do 200 this GUI sometimes is a little bit weird and then if you want to name it you see the set name here you check this which does this and then I can do it and apply. So it's a little bit of a cumbersome GUI on the HP. I mean, it's not it's not smooth. You would think when I create a VLAN up here, it would ask me for the name, but it doesn't. But, you know, it is what it is. VLAN ports. If you want to have, say, a certain port interface, be tied, say, an access port, uh, an access like uh, I want port number 18 to be on VLAN. So I'd pick 18. We can set port priority here. If we want to set ports to VLANs, that's here under participation and tagging. So let's say I wanted to set port 2 to be on that new VLAN I just created. I'd Up at the top, you pick the VLAN, go down here, and it's going to give me all my ports. And right now, E is exclude. So basically, 200 is not part of, or I'm sorry, port 2 is not even doing anything on 200. If I wanted to, actually, Sorry for the confusion. I want to pick one I'm not actually using. So let's do 11. So I'm not actually doing anything with 11. So this is 11. If I wanted to set it so that it would tag anything on VLAN 200, I'd set it to T. If I wanted to do native VLAN, meaning that I want to send this out as untagged, I would do U. And if I don't want it to do participate in VLAN 200 at all, I would set it to E. So the problem here is, let's say I've got a port and I want to tag a whole bunch of VLANs to then what I do is I go to VLAN 1 VLAN 1 is my native VLAN for most of these so I've got it set for untagged then I go to 5 and I set it to tagged then I go to 6 and I set it to tagged and I go to 7 you know so it's just and I set it tagged so if I want to say alright I got 20 VLANs and I've got a trunk port to a vSphere lab host like on 13 and I want to trunk all 20 of those VLANs, I have to go one by one by one by one through this list, make sure set it to T, hit apply, go to the next one, set it to T, hit apply. Very cumbersome. So I just wanted to show you this interface of how you configure it 
and that you would understand that what they mean by trunk is different than what Cisco means by trunk. And I've had some of our delivery guys get caught in that where they're trying to configure trunking with HP and it turns out to be miscommunication. So just want to make sure you got that. Some of the HPs use different GUIs, different interfaces, command lines, things like that. So you may not see this, but the terminology will carry over. So that's it for the quick little HP demonstration here. Let me just show you real quick since we're in the lab. 192.168.203. So this is the SG300. Quick little lab walkthrough since we're here. Basically, it is a really pretty GUI. There's also a fairly decent command line interface you can SSH into. But most of what you'll be doing here is under VLAN management. You can create VLANs here. You basically just add one. Say VLAN 200 and give it a name like I did on the other. You can also create a range all at one time. I hit apply and we're good. Gives me my success. There we go. If I want to edit or delete it, I just check it and do what I want to do. Go to interface settings. It's just talking about all the different interfaces. So we can, you know, set them to trunk mode, enable them, disable them, do whatever we want. And then you can do port to VLAN mapping. This is a little confusing, but basically what I can do is I can say, okay, VLAN 200 I just created. And don't let these 580 little dots here confuse you. And then I can say, okay, on VLAN 200, I want to tag it. So I can just go through here and click every port on the switch. I want to be tagging 200 or untagged for native or something like that you know so you can go through here and configure all of them at one time if you want to do it a little different way you can do VLAN to port so here's all my ports and I can come over here and kind of say okay untag tag 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 and make a whole bunch of changes so I can pick this guy so let me pick that guy make a change and say what I want him to do as far as join VLANs. So I can pick him. Let me show you that again. So the drop down box tells you which VLANs he's already participating in. So untagged, this is VLAN 5 is tagged, 6 tagged, 7 tagged, 100 is tagged. So those are trunk. So I pick the port, come down here to the bottom, there we go, and say join. And then I can select and add VLANs either tagged or untagged. What I've found is that the SG300 interface is a lot easier to make bulk changes than the HP interface. It's a little bit confusing, like port to VLAN, VLAN to port, uh, port VLAN membership or PVLAN that you've seen here, uh, maybe in some of these screens, does not stand for private VLAN. It stands for like access ports. So we're mapping a port to a VLAN just like we would on an access port. But once you kind of figure out what they mean here, it's a very, very good switch. We can do all sorts of stuff. You know, it supports spanning tree. Uh, so you can work with that. Ported management, link aggregations, green Ethernet so we can power down ports when we want to. It supports LACP. Like I've got an LACP trunk running. So like I've got a couple of them here. I've got one LACP lag or link aggregation to one of my Synologies, another one to the other Synology. And then I've got four of them connected to the HP. Two of them are active. The other two are standby in case of failover. So again, very good. And there's also some pretty good, it's pretty basic, but there is some static layer three routing. So if you have two VLANs and I want to communicate between those two, the switch can route between those two, kind of be a, a gateway for those two. So that's one reason I'm using this. But that's it for this quick demo of the SG300. Let's jump back to the slide deck. So that's that for the lab. We did the iOS config, an XOS config, a demo of the 1800, and then a bonus feature, we jumped over to the SG300. So that was pretty good. Give you kind of a quick overview of what your options are. Next is a very common area of question when setting up or connecting vSphere hosts. And this has to do with our load balancing and teaming options. Now, VMware has done a pretty decent job of this. They've done it on the best job, and by that I mean there's not a ton of overwhelming options. Some switches have a huge number of options for load balancing and teaming. 
VMware kind of gives you the best ones, the simplest ones, and some very, very interesting ones depending on what your license level is. So first of all, I want to get something out. There's no such thing as true load balancing with this. This is a common area of confusion that I see. I call it load distribution instead of balancing because let's say I've got four 1 gig NICs. I put those in a vSwitch and connect, you know, 50 VMs into that vSwitch. You know, if I'm doing two gig a second, I'm not going to have like half a gig, half a gig, half a gig, half a gig on those NICs. I may have half a gig, three quarters, you know, a quarter, you know, and then a half a gig. I think that's two. So, but it's distribution. So it's based on, uh, on kind of hashing or just, you know, a formula. And it's usually not based on kind of physical load. And even when there is one option that does do physical load, it doesn't do everything, you know, equally. So just get that out of the way. If you're expecting to get 8 gig of throughput on 8 1 gig NICs, you're going to be sadly disappointed. It's not going to happen. And so just keep that in mind. That's one reason we see people moving to 10 gig because I get 10 real gig of guaranteed throughput not this kind of load or balancing or distribution that we see here. And which one of these you use is depends on several things. First of all, your type of physical switches comes into play. So depending on what your switches are, it denotes what your options are. The traffic profile, and we'll talk about why this matters going to and from your VMs. Do you do a lot of one-to-one -one traffic? Do you do a lot of client connected to host? Do you, you know, just what happens and how do these things communicate you know, how are your VMs configured? Do they have one NIC, three NICs, one IP, a bunch of IPs? These things matter when you're kind of choosing which selection. VMware license level. Uh, Enterprise Plus has one called uh, load-based teaming, but you have to have Enterprise Plus and you have to be using the distributed switch for that. So that's one option if you're just doing enterprise licensing, you don't get to get to have. And then vSwitch type. As I mentioned, uh, load-based teaming requires the distributed switch. Everything else, all your other options, works with the standard vSwitch. And then the Nexus 1000V, being your third-party option, Nexus has a lot of different load balancing options. Kind of goes along with the Nexus switches. You can hash baits on all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, source, IP, destination IP, port, all kind of things. So you can get even more granular with it than you can with just vSphere. So... Network teaming. In most cases, you want all adapters on a vSwitch to be active. Most cases. There are times that we don't do that. But if you truly want to distribute load across them, you want them to be active. Again, there are some issues with blades and connectivity and 10 gig functions where we may want to have one be active and one be standby. This is common, say, in blade environments or even Cisco UCS blades where I have what we refer to as an A fabric and a B fabric. And if I want to transfer something from A to B, it has to kind of go out A up to your network core and back to B. So what you'll see, and I'll kind of, I'll probably show you this in the lab in a little bit, is especially, I'll, I'll, you'll see it definitely in the uh, distributed switch lesson that's coming up. But we do things so that we don't pass traffic from one fabric to another. Other blade vendors do the similar thing where they don't want to go outside the chassis unless they have to. So for example, vMotion, a blade may have two ports on it, one going to one switch, one going to the other. We want to make sure that vMotion always goes from, say, port A to port A on the other blade, never goes from port A to port B because that would be, you know, making it go outside the chassis. So we may do an active standby configuration there. But again, that's normally 10 gig connectivity, so it's not like we're forcing everything through a 1 gig straw. Just common things to think about. There are some best practices for teaming options. So when you set up teaming, you set up kind of how you want to hash and how you want to balance the traffic, but there's also some kind of failover and protection options. So for those, network failover detection is one. How does this vSphere host know that it's lost connectivity on a NIC? So one option is link status. Link status is real simple. Do I have a green link light or not? If I don't, the link's dead. If I do, I consider the link good. What happens if I'm connected to an upstream switch that has lost its connectivity. I still think the link is good because I'm talking out my port, but that upstream switch hasn't. And we'll talk about what you do in that situation, but this is common in, again, blade environments where I've got switches in a blade chassis. That blade may see a great link light to that chassis switch, but that chassis switch has lost all connectivity to the outside world. If vSphere doesn't know that, he's going to continue just throwing frames out the door 
not knowing that they're going into a black hole. But this is common, especially on rack servers. We'll just set link status. And as long as the link light is good, vSphere considers the link and the connection good, and we'll use it. The contrast to that is beacon probing. So beacon probing, each NIC will send out test frames and then wait to see if they come back on the other NICs. So if I send out a test frame on NIC1 and I see it come back on the other NICs, I assume that my upstream connectivity is all good and happy. It's good for detecting failures up the network. Again, common in blade environments and things like that. Two notes on this. You can't use it with IP hashing. We'll talk about IP hashing in a minute, but due to the way that it distributes load across NICs, we're not allowed to do IP hashing and this. It, it won't let you. Um, I was going to say it breaks it, but it won't even let you select that in the configuration. Second, you need an odd number of NICs for this to work. So kind of the thought here is if I've only got two NICs and each one sends out a test frame and neither of them see the other one, which NIC is bad? Which one has lost connectivity? We don't know. So you really need an odd number. So if you have three and they all send out frames and two guys get the other two guys' frames and nobody sees the third NIC's frames, guess who's bad? The third NIC. So then we can mark him as failed or an upstream failure and the NIC1 and NIC2 continue to function. So you need at least three NICs in the vSwitch for this to work. So that gets a little weird, especially on blades with two ports. Then you get into things like virtual NICs and being able to carve up NICs virtually to look like more than one. And does that really help you since it's still two physical connections? So this is not an option I see used a lot, but there are ways to kind of get around these upstream failures that we'll talk about here in a minute. Cisco offers a feature known as link state tracking. And this is what gets you around that upstream failure, but not having three NICs in a vSwitch. Commonly used in blade chassis, but still very useful in rack servers, especially if I've got rack servers connected to top of rack switches that then go to, say, a you know, distribution or core. And you configure the switch to understand upstream and downstream ports. So let's say I've got a Nexus 5000 or 5500 10 gig switch. I've got two of them. They're at the top of my rack. I've got a bunch of rack servers with each with two 10 gig connections. One 10 gig goes to one nexus, the other goes to the other nexus. I configure those nexus switches so the links going down to my servers are downstream ports. Links going up to the core are known as upstream ports. If all the upstream ports go down, links are dead, it then passes that link down message to the ports going to vSphere. vSphere sees those links go dead and stops traffic. So you would set it up to use link status tracking on the vSphere host and then the switch would actually down the ports on its side, which would down the ports on the vSphere side, and the tracking would figure it out. When the upstream ports come up, it'll turn the downstream ports back up. So it basically signals that connectivity loss down. Without this, what we talked about a minute ago where, you know, vSphere thinks the links are good, but the switch has lost its upstream connectivity and traffic gets black holed, this doesn't happen as it passes it on down. So we use this a lot more often than we will use beacon probing. Again, because you got to have multiple NICs or three NICs and you can't do it with IP hashing. So we don't use beacon probing very often. It's normally, you know, link status with something like link state. I do a lot, again, Cisco. So, I, you know, Cisco offers this functionality. Other switch vendors should as well. So look that up and see how you configure it for them. Here's a diagram kind of showing this. So what I've got is two distribution switches and these other switches kind of call them access or whatever you want to call them here. And so what we have is server here connected to A and B, A and B, A and B, A and B. So we kind of figure out what is we consider to be a primary connection, which is the bold or the solid line, and a secondary, which is the dotted. And then we create what are called link state groups. So going up to the core, this would be his link state group one. This one over here would be his link state group two. Same thing here, one and two. And then on the downstreams, we figure out, you know, what's, we tie these together. So this link state one goes to this link state group one, this link state group two goes to that link state group two and vice versa. So if we sever these connections here on one, it will sever these here and pass that link down message, but we still have secondary functionality over to the other switches. So again, you're just kind of grouping ports together and saying, look, if I lose you up here, down these ports down here. 
And here's a quick example showing the link state configuration. So first is the upstream port channel example. Not the member ports and the port channel, just the port channel itself. So it's pretty standard. Interface port channel description, trunking, natives, all that. But we just add link state group 1 upstream. To any downstream ports, they go into the vSphere host, we add link state group 1 downstream. And it matches these together. So we may have 20 ports like this. And, you know, maybe, you know, a single port channel like this. And if I lose all member ports of the port channel, and therefore the port channel interface goes down, it'll pass that down to these, and these will be shut down as well. So it's really simple configuration. Really great idea to do that, given what your network topology looks like. Continuing on with network teaming, the next option is notify switches. And a link, when a link fails, do you want to notify the physical switches? And the short answer is yes. Uh, the only time you want to say no is when using Microsoft Network Load Balancing in unicast mode. So if you're doing that, and you probably want to split these connections out to a separate vSwitch just for that network load balancing and set it to no. The rest of the time you want it to be yes. The reason is really simple. Let's say again I've got two 10 gig connections. I've got both of those 10 gigs connected into a vSwitch with all my VM port groups. So VMs are being hashed across both of those connections. Some go to number one, some go to number two. If link one fails and the VMs automatically transition to two, so upstream aren't going to know this yet, and they're going to continue to try to reach those VMs that were on one through the port of one, and traffic will black hole. If we set this to yes, when those VMs transition over to port two, vSphere will send out what's known as a gratuitous ARP. He basically sends out an ARP saying, hey, the MAC address for this VM is mapped to this IP, and he sends it out the ports off port 2, and then the switches update their MAC address table. So the table they use to know which MAC addresses are off of which port gets updated, and all those VMs now look like they're on the port connected to 10 gig number 2. Therefore, it's a smooth transition. vMotion is the same way. When you vMotion a VM from one host to another, when it gets to the destination, it sends out a gratuitous ARP, and that's how the switches kind of know where to start forwarding traffic to. So again, leave this on yes, unless you're using Microsoft Network Load Balancing in unicast mode. Next is fail back. So it specifies whether you want a NIC that failed but is now restored to be active. In most cases, this is yes. This really only applies if you've got NIC set for active and standby. If you've got four NICs in a vSwitch and they're all active, 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 when one comes back online, it automatically goes to active. But let's say you've got four NICs and it's you know active, 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 standby. NIC1 fails, the standby NIC jumps up, takes its place, does everything just right, and then you replace or fix the issue you had with the first NIC. Well, if you set fail back to yes, the NIC that used to be standby goes back to standby, and the NIC you just repaired goes back to active. If you say no, the NIC you repaired becomes the standby NIC, and the others maintain as be active. It's really up to you. Most cases I set this to yes, that way I know what they are at all times in a working configuration. But, you know, it's kind of, you know, it's not a big deal, but I normally do leave this on yes. So now let's talk a little bit more about load balancing. Load balancing in depth. As I said, there's no option that guarantees true load balancing across multiple NICs. It's what I'd consider to be statistical distribution of load. Sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. And if you constantly lose, then we need to adjust what you're doing and how you're doing it. No matter which hashing mechanism you use, no single what I call conversation between two systems will get more than a single NIC throughput. So the most granular we can do with vSphere is hash by IP. So let's say I've got a server, a server VM, and out of the network I've got, you know, 50 VM clients. Or, nope, let's do this. I've got one server VM and one client, and they're going to talk to each other, and they're going to transfer a lot of data. So I'm thinking, okay, they got a lot of data. I'm going to put a bunch of NICs in the client machine, do a, like an ether channel to those, or a port channel to those. I'm going to put four NICs in the vSwitch with the port group for this VM, and so I should see like four gig of throughput, and you're only going to see one gig. Why is that? Because the connections are hashed based on source and IP address. It matches up source and destination IP, and the first conversation it sees, it hashes to the first NIC. Second one will go to the second, third go to third, fourth to fourth. So you're not, you're not going to use more than one. That conversation between the client and the server is only going to go across one NIC. Even if I open up 10 different apps on 10 different ports, 
because we're hashing by source destination IP, they still hash across the same link. Now, again, something like the Nexus can do hashing based on, you know, ports and all sorts of things. So if you had multiple ports on one end running to multiple TCP ports on the other end at the server, it could theoretically hash across multiple connections. But there's no guarantee. It's all statistics and there's a formula for it. The way that we win in this situation is if we have a single server VM and 20 client VMs with different IP addresses, then we should in theory hash reasonably well across those four NICs. But again, we don't look at anything like how busy the traffic is. That host one is just slamming the one gig connection and host, you know, two through 20 or not. It's all just up to the formula. So keep that in mind. Uh, we see this a lot with iSCSI. I see people put multiple NICs in for iSCSI and wonder why they only use one. Well now with vSphere you can use multiple NICs for iSCSI but you end up creating multiple VM kernels with multiple IPs against targets on the iSCSI server with multiple IPs to get around these hashing issues. This is why 10 gig is becoming much more popular. So just keep these in mind when you do it. The key is to match your traffic profile. Is it one-to-one -one communication? Is it multiple to one? You know, what do I need to do? And let's we'll go through the different options for hashing. So the first one in the default is load balancing based on virtual port ID. So let's say that you know we've got a, a, a vSwitch with four NICs in it. Each VM gets a virtual port ID. Don't care how many NICs you've assigned to the VM. You could have a VM with 20 NICs in it. Each VM gets a single virtual port ID. So all of its connections are going to be hashed across a single NIC. All of its stuff is going to go across one. The first VM that comes online will get hashed across NIC 1. The second one, 2, third one, 3, fourth one, 4, etc. And so the idea again is that you know we don't get to choose. So if I have 4 NICs and 20 VMs, I'm going to have basically 5 VMs per NIC, irrespective of what their load is. We could happen to hash out that NIC 1 gets the four busiest VMs and the rest of the VMs are idle, so you'll see that one NIC be under constant overcommitment and the rest of the NICs be under. And you're going to think, well, man, this just doesn't work. Well, it's working as designed. It's just not working for what you need. But virtual port ID is the default. It's simple and it works very well for any environment, meaning I could have four NICs connected to four different switches from four different manufacturers that are not connected, you know, that aren't talking to each other, and this will work because it's basically doing hashing based on MAC addresses. So it's not going to, you know, distribute one single NIC's worth of traffic across multiple links or anything like that. Therefore, it's very simple. There's nothing the switches need to be aware of, and that's why it's the default. It just works out of the box. It's going to keep you from calling VMware support or Cisco TAC when it doesn't work. It's just going to work. Here's a diagram basically showing what I'm talking about. So I've got four switches. These are linked together, but they're not, they don't talk to each other. This isn't like a switch stack where multiple switches appear as a single switch. Four separate switches, all connected to four different NICs, and this could be a you know distributed switch or a port group. The first VM online hashes to this one, second one to that one, third to that one, fourth to that one. And so we just, you know, it just one to one. If we had the fifth VM, it would come back over here, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, etc., and just keep going. So when we send data, you know, if we need to talk to this VM, it's going to go to the switch over here and up. And that's the way it's always going to go. It's never going to do any, it's never going to go up the direct path and over because that's not where it was hashed to. The MAC address from this VM is seen on this switch port and no other, so that's the way it's going to get there. It's simple and it works and it takes no special configuration. You do not have to configure port channels or ether channels or anything like that on your switches. Set them for trunking, pass the right VLANs, and then you can just connect in as many ports as you want. And for most people, you know, it works. They rarely have a VM that uses more than one gig of throughput. And if it does become an issue, we can do some things to work around it. But again, it works in almost all cases. The next option is hash by MAC address or MAC hashing. It's very similar to virtual port ID. The only difference is if you have a VM and he has four NICs in that VM, we've passed four, you know, VNICs up to the VM, 
then he has four MAC addresses. So instead of it being one VM to one NIC, physical NIC, each of those different VNICs MAC addresses get hashed to a physical NIC. So if you had four physical NICs, and the VM has four VNICs, you're basically your VM is going to hash across all four of those, you know, NIC for NIC. It's not going to be equal. It's going to be one virtual NIC kind of maps to one physical NIC in the hashing. It doesn't require any special configuration. It's just like virtual port ID. The switches don't need to talk. You don't need to configure port channels or anything like that. If you have VMs with more than one NIC, I recommend you flipping to this from virtual port ID. But if all your VMs have a single NIC assigned to them, it's exactly the same as virtual port ID. So there's no real benefit to doing it based on that. Just take a look at what you're doing and see if it makes sense to flip to this. Again, another example, we've just got this, you know, basically we split out. So this VM has two NICs, so he's going to hash against two of these and, you know, but he's going to hash this one to here and this one to here. So if traffic needs to go here, it'll go to switch three to this and over. But if it was trying to talk, say I had an application here that was bound to an IP on this NIC, then traffic would go here, here, and over. So this gets into a little bit of network design and, just, and application discussion of, you know, where are my clients connected to? Which of these switches? Where are my IPs bound to? You don't really get to pick where you don't get to pick at all kind of where these guys hash against. It's all a numeric formula. So again, this may be a situation where you win. It may be a situation where you lose. Depends where your clients are connected. But again, different switches, different vendors. They don't need to talk. No port channels or anything created. It'll just work. And then there's IP hash. So IP hash is the most granular. And it's the, usually the best option for those without enterprise licensing. With IP hash, I take a look at each connection's, you know, source and destination IP. So if I have a VM with a VNIC with one IP address on it connected to a vSwitch with, say, eight 1 gig NICs in it, and I've got a couple hundred clients talking to that VM, each one of those client-to-server IP pairs is considered a conversation and will be hashed separately. So all couple, you know, 200 of those client connections to the VM should be hashed relatively evenly across those eight NICs. That's why it's the most granular and the recommended if you can. But there's a couple of things here. Your switches have to support this. Normally that means you have to be able to take all eight of those NICs and put them in a single port channel. Let's say I have two switches that don't talk to each other and therefore I cannot create a port channel with all eight of those NICs. I could do, say, four going to one and four going to another. Well, I can't do that because what's going to happen is is that the MAC address for that VM is going to show up on both switches depending on what the clients are and how the IP gets hashed. And you're going to see what are called MAC flapping errors in your switch log. It's going to see like, oh, there's a MAC. Oh, wait, it's over there. Oh, wait, it's back here. Oh, wait, it's on that port. Now it's on this port. Now it's on that port. And it causes problems. So the way around this is a couple of things. One, we can do something like VSS for Cisco Catalyst 6500 is chassis switches. We can take two of those, point them at each other, and to a host they look like a single switch and so I can have four NICs going to one, four NICs going to other, but to the host it's a single port channel and those two Catalyst switches communicate. Very similar functionality on VPC or virtual port channel for Cisco's Nexus switches. A lot of people have this kind of switch collaboration feature set. They call it different things. It's common to see this on stacked switches. So if I have five 1U or 2U little kind of topper rack switches that can be stacked and appear as one switch, we can do a port channel across all those switches to the, to the end host appears as one. So the key here is all of the NICs connected to the vSwitch, the physical NICs connected to the vSwitch need to be in a single port channel, at least from the host point of view. And then you need to set the switch to do hashing based on source destination IP. And then it'll work. If you're seeing MAC flapping, MAC flapping issues, it means that the switches do not see that as a single port channel and you need to look at your configuration. So with IP hash, all communication between the client and VM will flow over one NIC. So with that, if I have 200 clients talking to that VM, the most throughput that any one client will see is one gigabit because I can't have that conversation between the one client and the one server across multiple NICs. It's only going to hash across one physical NIC. So while I will be able to hash all 200 across a bunch of them and have an aggregate of up to 8 gigabit, 
a single client talking to the single VM will only use one gigabit. If you need a single machine to talk to a single VM at more than one gigabit, you need to go to 10 gig. As simple as that. The answer to that question is go 10 gig. So, you know, simple there. It's most effective when there are a lot of clients talking to the VMs. It allows for that granular hashing. And again, it's the most complex for physical switch configuration. You need to make sure they're in an ether channel or port channel and you need to make sure that a hashing type is set for IP source destination. Real quick, this is another diagram. It shows this. So we're going to say, all right, we took our four switches. These are Cisco 3750s, for example. They're 2960, something like that that can be stacked with back-end stack cables. So this is now one stack. To the host and to the servers, this appears as one switch, not four switches. It looks like one. Therefore, we can take all four of these, and put them into a single port channel. And then these two clients here could hash across different. Since these have different IPs here, even if he has one IP, this mapping of source or source to destination IP is one hash mechanism. This source to destination IP is another hash mechanism. So these guys can go up and right in and hash across multiple different NICs. So this is the one that's recommended if you have the capability to do it unless you have Enterprise Plus licensing, and we'll talk about that here in a second. What if I do have Enterprise Plus licensing? Well, there's a newer feature or hashing mechanism called load-based teaming. In the vSphere or VI client, it's called route based on physical NIC load, but we call it, you know, in all the documentation, talking to people, you're going to see it called LBT or load-based teaming. It's the only one that is utilization aware, meaning you know, I told you before that we could hash all the really busy connections across one NIC and leave other NICs underutilized. They don't look at utilization. Load-based teaming does. From a simple point of view, load-based teaming is very similar to virtual port ID hashing, meaning each VM, irrespective of Macs or IPs, gets, you know, hashed across a single NIC. Where it's different is that Load-based teaming looks at NIC utilization. It looks at both ingress and egress. And if a NIC exceeds 75% load for 30 seconds, it will move some things to other NICs. So if NIC1 is heavily saturated by a couple of VMs, after 30 seconds, it'll start moving those busy VMs to other NICs. So you can see this. I'll do it for you in the lab demo where we will saturate one NIC and after 30 seconds or so, you'll see the load balance out across the multiple NICs. It's really nice. Again, though, it's not going to let one single client talking to a single VM use more than one NIC capacity. It will help to distribute load, but if you need more than a single NIC capacity, you've got to go up to 10 gig or 40 gig or whatever. It's just no way around that with the way Ethernet works and you know, TCP IP works right now. The nicest things about LBT, it's easy. Again, it's similar to virtual port ID, meaning you can connect four NICs to four switches from four different vendors. There's no port channeling or ether channeling involved. The downside is that it is not hashing based on something like IP. So if I have one VM that everybody in the world talks to, then all that traffic to that VM is going to be hashed over a single NIC. If I really want to do that broad hashing across a whole bunch of NICs to a busy VM, this may not be your best choice. IP hashing may be your best choice. Again, you have to look at your traffic profile, but this solves a lot of problems for almost every customer that I work with. If they can use it, this is normally what we use, and they've been very happy with it. So it's just the most proactive in distributing load. But again, if you have a VM, you know, a single VM that gets a lot of traffic from a lot of different clients, you may want to do IP hashing. And uh, that's, you know, again, look at your profile. So with this, this is kind of our, you know, similar to what we did with route by virtual port ID. With this client on the left, his traffic will go over and always go to this NIC. Well, they both go to the same NIC. So he goes up to the NIC and left. He goes up to the NIC and right. These other NICs are sitting there looking at each other, twiddling their thumbs. And what we'll see is after a little bit of time, it'll rehash this VM over to this NIC. And therefore, his traffic will go through up to here and over and it's more proactive on how it does load distribution. Very simple. Again, notice there's no switch stack here. It's just a couple of independent switches. So very simple configuration, very easy to use. Requirements of virtual port ID hashing, 
but with this proactive management of distribution. So again, if you've got Enterprise Plus and you're using the distributed switch, I absolutely suggest you look at LBT. And now let's do a lab showing this. So what I'm going to do is have a couple VMs connected to another VM. And we're going to see, you know, I'm going to fire up iPerf, which is a throughput program, something that generates a lot of network traffic. And then after time, we'll see that rebalance those NICs. So with that, let's go ahead and jump into the lab. Okay, we're back over here in the lab again. And uh, this is a fairly simple demonstration. It just takes a little bit of setup. So I'll show you how I've set it up to kind of demonstrate what I'm going to show you with load-based teaming. The idea here is that I had to set it up so that all traffic would be hashed across the same NIC on a destination server. So what I've got is I've got four XP machines, either the ones we've used several times in the lab. I just I rename them so that they make sense in what we're doing. And I've got two of these, XP1 running on Optimus and XP2 running on Optimus. And these are going to be the targets. So I'll show you what I mean by that here in a second. Three and four are running on Megatron. And I'm using a tool called iPerf. It's a really good network diagnostic tool. It's uh, available for Windows, Linux, uh, you know, Mac OS X, about anything. And it's very useful for kind of doing a stress test on the network. So you can adjust all sorts of little settings. And, you know, you set up servers, you set up clients, you can have a bunch of clients pointed to one server, however you want to do it. It's just a useful tool. So if we take a look at XP1 console, what we'll see, give it a second, we'll probably get a warning at the top since I've got it open in a couple places. Yeah, we do. And I'm running iPerf. And what I'm doing is I'm running iPerf dash S, which means I want you to be a server, listen for clients to connect to me. And I've set the TCP window size up to like 64K to kind of expand out the performance. And so you can see here that we've been running, I've, I've been running some uh, sessions here. And I've got that running as server on 1 and 2. Same thing here, iperf-s. And then 3 and 4 are run as the client machines. So here we run iperf, it's a command line tool obviously, iperf, window size, Dash T10,000 just says run this for 10,000 seconds. I just did that so it would run a long test. And then dash C means run me in client mode. And here is the IP address for the server that I'm connecting to. So I've got three connecting to one of these and four connecting to the other. And I'll show you that here. So what I've done up on these two machines here is just add a couple of NICs and basically ping one IP address, ping another IP address until I saw that they were hashed across the same physical connection on Optimus. And if we look at Optimus here, configuration, we will see that what I've done, I'm sorry, networking, go to the distributed switch, and I've only got two uplinks. So it should be VMNIC0 and VMNIC1. I could do all four. But at that point, I'm hashing the NICs across more physical connections with load balancing protocol, and it just makes it more complicated for me to do this demo. So normally, I would, you know, normally in my lab, I have all four NICs. Doesn't help to do one NIC because, you know, I can't really show you anything. So I do have it set up here as two NICs for the uplink. If we look at the distributed switch configuration, what we'll see here is if we go down to VM network, which is what everything's connected to, manage this port group, and look at teaming, we're doing it route based on source MAC hash. So basically, you know, one of those XP machines, I believe it was XP1, I've got three NICs emulated for that guy. Therefore, he has three MAC addresses, and I figure that way I'm balancing, you know, across NIC1, NIC2, and probably against NIC1 again. But I did that so that I can make sure, ping a couple things, and get traffic to run all across one of these NICs. And it ended up being, I believe, VM NIC 0. We can see that because if I come back to host, go to Optimus, go to Performance, and I've got a real-time chart running here just showing NIC performance, the data receive rate on NIC 0 is like doing a you know 100,000 kilobit a second. So it's been going up and down around 115 or so, and which is, gives us about close to 900 megabit. This is a gigabit switch, gigabit NICs. There it goes. It jumped up since I restarted that other one. So we're 900 megabit is about as good as I'm going to get in my lab. It's not really tweaked out. I don't have jumbo frames on, which would give me, you know, on gig, it's 
not much, a couple of percent, but you know, overall it, it, we can see it's kind of maxing that link out. Now the problem here is, is that VM NIC1 is doing almost nothing. And I'll scroll you over here to the chart, which makes it even easier to see. So we've got these two, two VMs. They're throwing a lot of traffic across the wire, but as I've talked about, you know, with the different hashing types, it's kind of a roll of the dice. It's a, it's a, you know, a mathematical algorithm that dictates how things get hashed. Sometimes you win, and sometimes you lose. And in this case, we have lost. Both of these VMs, heavy traffic, are going across the same NIC. So that doesn't really help us. That's why I say it's not load balancing. It is load distribution. And we got distributed on the same NICs. So how do we fix this? Well, we fix it by turning on load-based teaming. So I'll flip that over. We'll give it, you know, 30, 45 seconds for the algorithm to kick in and look at everything. And what you're going to see is it's going to move one of those VMs from VM NIC 0 to VM NIC 1. And then the traffic should about be 50-50, mainly because I'm saturating the links as best I can. You know, if you, were, if you weren't having such equal requests from clients, it may not be 50-50. You might get 70-30, 60-40. There's no telling. It just all comes down to your workload and your traffic type. But again, demonstration purposes only. So let's go here. We'll go back over. We will go to networking. And we can change this port group. One neat little setting I don't think I've showed you yet, and I will again later, is you can do mass changes to port groups by using this little manage port group item. So if I wanted to switch all of these to load-based teaming, I could right-click, manage port groups, and you can pick what you want to change. So I'm going to do teaming and failover. Hit next. It says, which of these do you want to change? Well, I'll do, uh, since all the other ones are still set from before my uh, configuration here, I'll just choose this one. Now I could again go and manually just change this one, but if I wanted to change all of them, which for demonstration again, I'll go ahead and do because I'm just going to change it back to what they were. We'll say next. And it says, okay, what do you want me to change them all to? Well, I want you to change them all to route based on physical NIC load, which is load based teaming. So I'll say next and finish. And you'll see, you can't really see here, but I'll see if I can show you kind of hard to do using a remote desktop here. There we go. It went through and reconfigured all the DB ports. So it's a great way to do mass changes if you got 20 or 30 or whatever port groups, you don't have to go one by one. So we go back to where we were to the performance tab. So let me remove this again. And we'll give it a minute. So again, load-based teaming, it looks every 30 seconds. If a physical NIC is above 75% utilization, it'll try to move some VMs from to other available physical NICs. So we'll just sit here and wait. In a minute, we should start to see this change. There we go. Hopefully, we're going to see things shift over to NIC 1. So this flat line here at the bottom, they should kind of cross or even out, and you'll see it kind of distribute that load. All right, we're starting to see this. This is creeping up which is good. That's what we want to see. I'll hit refresh. And now if you notice, we're seeing, you know, 97,000 kilobytes and 79,000 right at 80,000 kilobytes. We'll hit refresh again because I'm an impatient person. And we're going to see this kind of balance out. There we go, 95 and 82. So what it's done is it's moved one of those, one of those VMs hashed across VM NIC 0 to VM NIC 1. If I had four NICs and a bunch of VMs doing traffic, we would start to see that kind of distribute across all the available NICs. So this is a great example of why I'm a big fan of load-based teaming. You know, it's the only option that actually looks at NIC utilization and makes decisions based on that. But again, remember, it falls back to that, you know, hash based on virtual port ID, basically. So my XP1 machine with three NICs in it, all three of those NICs are going to be hashed across one physical NIC. It's not as granular as MAC address hashing. It's not as granular as IP hashing. But unlike those, which are just mathematical algorithms, this actually looks at how much traffic is crossing those connections and tries to get them relatively evenly balanced as best it can. So it's you know very simple. You don't need any special switch configuration for it. Anywhere you can use virtual port ID or MAC hashing, you can absolutely use load-based teaming. Really, the only requirements are Enterprise Plus licensing, which I know for some people is not an easy requirement, and 
you have to be using the virtual distributed switch or the vSphere distributed switch, uh, which again, if you've got plus, I think you need to be doing that anyway, and therefore you can take advantage of this. So again, real simple lab, took a little bit of setup, so if you want to replicate this in your lab, just kind of use the performance tool here, start pushing traffic across with something like IPPerf or IPPerf, or you could do large file copies, but IPPerf is nice because like I can set it for a 10,000 second duration and not worry about files and, and all that. And then you can just set this up and watch it flip over. And again, it works very, very well. Just make sure you set your hashing type to buy Mac or to buy Mac or something like that, and then flip it over and watch it kind of rebalance those. So that's it. Again, really cool little lab to show off. I, I love this. I'm a networking guy, so I think this is neat. But uh, that's it for the lab, so let's jump back to the slide deck. So that's it for this lesson. Uh, we covered a lot of stuff here, you know, a lot of detail things, a lot of, a lot of things that I get questions on very commonly. So we started with what's the big deal. What's the big deal is there's a lot of different ways to connect vSphere host to the physical network. It's something that I often spend a lot of time on when doing vSphere designs or educational workshops with different groups and they want to understand all these options because you know by default things just kind of work you can do hash by virtual port ID with any set of switches and that's commonly what I see people set it forget it and move on but if you're trying to get better performance get better IO then you need to look at something else and maybe look at what your switches are and kind of configure out what you need to do went over some physical connectivity thoughts and best practices you know just gave you know, things like if you've got internal NICs and add-on NICs, make sure you spread things across, kind of some of your configuration options. Showed you some topology examples. We'll hit even more of those when we talk about the vSphere distributed switch in detail, which honestly, again, a lot of that can be applied to standard switches, and I'll talk about those as we do it. But the key here is, you know, I give you examples and I've given you some other reference material. There's no right or wrong answer. I mean, there's definitely ways not to do things, but it really depends on your workload, your environment, what your physical switches look like, how many ports you've got in your server, you know, all that stuff. So talked about some examples, gave you some suggested topologies, and then physical switch configuration, which is fairly simple, but you want to make sure and do things like, you know, set it to be an end host on the physical switch so we're not going through spanning tree learning listening processes we want to make sure those links come up very quickly easily and so just make sure that you set all your ports to be the same set your trunking correctly set your protocols correctly and make sure spanning tree is not going to block a port for 50 seconds if you have to pull a cable and plug it back in and then probably the most complicated piece of this lesson and again one I commonly answer questions on which is the teaming and load balancing options. You know, hash by virtual port ID or MAC hashing, which is in most cases, if your VMs only have one NIC, are really the same. Again, tried and true. You don't need anything special. The other more granular option is IP hashing, but that takes some special configuration on your uplink switches. Things have to be put in a port channel. The switch has to know that all four, say four of those NICs are in a port channel and he can hash IP across all those. So you have to set it on the vSphere side. You have to set it on the physical switch side. If you're being smart and you're connecting to multiple physical switches so one outage doesn't take you down, those switches need to communicate. So Cisco's Catalyst 6500s can do what's called VSS. Uh, their Nexus line can do what's called VPC, virtual port channel. Nortel and HP have similar type of functionalities. Or you can do, say, a stack of switches, which is very common but they need to be able to communicate and and have a single port channel kind of span multiple switches to do IP hashing and then at the end you know I showed you load based teaming you know hash based on physical NIC load that one is kind of the silver bullet for a lot of people solves a lot of problems real simple to implement there's a couple of edge or corner cases where it may not be the best fit where say IP hashing may be a better fit but again give it a good hard look if you can take advantage of it so that's it for this section. We're going to dive into some other stuff with the VDS coming up. This, the things we talked about here, directly apply there. Uh, most of this goes right over. We'll talk more about topologies, more about some examples, and really start getting into the configuration side of the, the distributed switch. So with that, look forward to seeing you on the next lesson.